This is the lesson for chapter five, lesson three, on conditional probability and independence. So the guiding question is up here that I'd like you to focus on. Uh, using the general multiplication rule and the conditional probability formula, how do we calculate the probability of two events both occurring? Uh, how does this change if the events are independent? So focus on that as we go. Remember, independence means the outcome of one event does not affect the probability of the outcome of another event, and vice versa. So conditional probability. Let's look at what we mean by conditional probability. Um, right here we have a conditional probability notation. So we have P, parentheses, B, vertical line, A, close parentheses. That means the probability of event B occurring, and then the vertical line means given that A has already occurred. So this is saying, what's the likelihood that event B occurs if we know that event A has already occurred. That's what we call conditional probability. So it's given the fact that one event has occurred, what's the probability of the second event? Um, if, if the probability of one event affects the probability of the occurrence of a second event, then they're not independent. Remember, independence is like coin flips. My uh, coin flips are independent, meaning the second coin flip is the 50-50 chance of heads, tails, regardless of whether I got heads or tails on the first flip. I could flip 10 heads in a row, that 11th flip is still a 50-50 chance because all those events are independent. Now, with drawing a card, uh, like let's say we're looking at event A as the probability of drawing a heart. If, um, if I look at event A as they're drawing a heart on the first draw and B as event as drawing it on the second draw, and I am drawing without replacing the cards in the deck, then those two events are not independent because the first probability would be 13 hearts out of 52 cards, and then depending on whether I got a heart or not, I'd only have 51 cards left for my second draw. So either whether I got a heart or whether I didn't get a heart, the probability of getting it on the second draw will be different, just from the fact that I have one less card in the deck, um, and I also possibly have one less heart, depending on whether or not I got a heart on the first draw. So those two events are not independent, because one occurring changes the probability that the second one occurs. So conditional probabilities relate to conditional distributions that we went over, since it's the probability of the value of one variable given the specific value of the first. So not too different from conditional distributions. Now, independent events. Two events, A and B, are independent if one occurring has no effect on the probability that the other will happen. So in probability notation, we'd write it like this. The probability of event B occurring, given that A has occurred, equals the probability of event B occurring. That means A occurring doesn't change the probability of B. So the conditional probability for B does not change just because event A has occurred. Um, and P, the probability of A occurring, given B, has already occurred equals the probability of A. That just means that event B already occurring does not change the probability of event A. So uh, independent events, one occurring does not change the probability of the second occurring and vice versa. So two separate rolls of a six-sided die are independent from each other. So let's say that our event is rolling a two on the first on the first roll and a two on the second roll. If I roll a 2 the first time, it has no effect on the probability the second time. There's still a 1 6 chance of it occurring. If I didn't roll a 2 on the first roll, it still has no effect on, this, on the probability of the second roll. It's still a 1 6 chance. So if an event has occurred it, and changes, like when we talked about drawing a heart from a deck on successive draws from the deck, those are not independent events because the first event occurring changes the probability of the second event. Um, Sometimes um, two events may not be independent. It doesn't mean that there's an association between them. Uh, so sometimes one event occurring and changing the probability of the second event means there's an association, like one, one variable is affecting this other variable. Uh, but P of A given B could be close to the probability of A but not equal, then they're not independent, but there's not an association between the two. If we see a large jump in the probability, like if B of event B occurring, uh, always changes the probability of A occurring by quite a bit, then there we would look at an association between the two. For example, in the in the example with drawing a heart from the uh, from the deck, there's an, those are associated just because of the nature of changing the amount of cards left in the deck. Now here's a great way to represent uh, possible outcomes, especially on successive occurrences of, of a chance event. So a tree diagram is a really nice way to visualize all the possible outcomes and their associated probabilities. So whenever you have um, multiple occurrences of a chance event, like flipping a coin twice, three times, 
drawing a card. I'd like you to draw a tree diagram. Let's take a closer look at this tree diagram. So on the left, we start with our chance event, toss a coin. Then we have a first toss and a second toss. We know that we have two separate tosses here. Uh, we branch out from toss a coin to the two possibilities. If there's more than two possibilities, then we would have three branches if there were three possibilities. If there were four possibilities, we'd have four branches. So here we have heads or tails. And we know there's a one in two chance of heads and a one in two chance of tails. After the first toss, if we got heads on the first toss, we could have heads or tails on the second toss. Each have an equal chance. One half, one half. That means these are independent events. This event occurring did not change the uh, probability of heads occurring or tails occurring again. If we have tails on the first coin flip, we then have a, a, a possibility of one half of flipping heads and then tails. And this is also nice because then we can calculate at the end the probability of two events, like two heads. We go one half, one half. In order to calculate the probability, we multiply. That's the multiplication rule. One half times one half is one fourth. Now, in this case with tossing a coin, these all have equal chances of one in four. So that's how we draw a tree diagram. Anytime you have multiple chance events occurring, please draw a tree diagram. Then over here, you could label what it is. So here, this where it says probability of two heads equals one half times one half equals one fourth, we should go right there. And then you do the same thing for the other chance events. So this would be the probability of heads, tails equals one half times one half, which is one fourth, and so on. So the tree diagram is an excellent way to represent it and determine all the possibilities as well as their respective probabilities. Uh, it helps us determine the sample space. Remember, that's all possible outcomes, and then the probability of each individual outcome. Instead of trying to write it out, and then we'll lose track. So this is a nice, easy way to do it. Um, so here's directions for doing it. I kind of went over all these when I was zoomed in on the tree diagram. Feel free to pause and review them again. So that brings us to the general multiplication rule. Um, the probability that events A and B both occur can be found using the rule. The probability, so this is the probability of A intersection B. Remember, intersection, think of that as and. That means they both occur. Is the probability of A times the probability of B given that A occurred. Okay? So remember, this will work for all events, even if um, they're not independent. Since this probability of B might change given that A has occurred. Remember, probability of B given A is the probability that prob event B occurs given that A already has occurred. If they're independent, then we can write it like this. That means because independent events, the probability of B given that A occurs doesn't change, it's just the probability of B occurring, then for independent events, since A occurring doesn't affect B, the probability that B occurs, it would just be the probability of A times the probability of B, as we saw in the previous tree diagram, where the, the probability of both occurring was one half, all we have to do is multiply. Since the probability of second heads is the same as uh, the probability of a heads. So uh, this rule is just kind of stating for the two events to both occur, one has to occur, and then given that the first event occurred, the second must occur. If, if they're not independent, then the probability of the second would be different. If they are independent, then the uh, probability of B would not change. An excellent time to use the complement rule is when you see probability of finding at least one. So if, if you ever asked a question of finding at least once, like at least one head um, or at least one positive test, um, if there were, we're talking about a test like you'll be in the multiple choice question, um, although this, this does not occur, the complement rule won't help you with the uh, multiple choice. Well, I take that back. It could help. There's multiple ways to solve it. Um, so, if you see at least once, though, think of the complementer rule, because the probability of at least one event A would be one minus the complement of A, which is no event A's. So, if event A is at least one thing happening, then subtract it from the probability that it doesn't happen at all. So, that's the best way to do these problems, because it's, it's oftentimes there's less computation. So, for 10 coin flips and event A being one heads, the probability of at least one heads would be one minus the probability of 10 tails. That'd be one half to the tenth. So one minus that is 0 0.9990234375, or about 99.9%. So the probability of at least one heads in 10 flips is 99.9%, a little bit bigger than that. Um, so whenever you see at least one, think the complement rule, and then you can do one minus uh, the probability that there's none. So this would be like the probability of no heads. 
So there's a common misconception, a common confusion with mutually exclusive and independent. Um, there is a relationship between the two, because if two events are mutually exclusive, they cannot be independent. In fact, if they're mutually exclusive, you know when one event occurs, the probability of the second event occurring is zero. And so that, that shows us that they're not independent, because one event occurring changes the probability of the other. So consider uh, two events, event A, a person's born male, and a per event B, a person's pregnant. They're mutually exclusive, meaning males can't be pregnant, and someone who is pregnant cannot be male. So if we know that event A has occurred, the person is male, then we know that event B cannot occur, the person is pregnant. So that makes them mutually exclusive. So if we know A has occurred, then the probability of B occurring is zero. So that means they're not independent and they are mutually exclusive. So mutually exclusive events, the conditional probabilities for them um, corresponding to each other would be zero because if one event occurs, the probability of the other occurring is zero. To find the conditional prob probability, probability of B given that A has occurred, we use this formula. The probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of A. Okay? So remember the rule, the multiplication rule for finding the intersection, and you would divide it by the probability that A occurs. And that'll give us the conditional probability of what the probability of B given that A has occurred. So here uh, is an interesting uh, illustration of who reads the paper and who reads both. So keep in mind our Venn diagram. Outside of it represents people who read neither. The yellow here, all of A, represents people who read USA Today. The part that's not green represents the part that read USA Today but not the New York Times. The part that's blue here represents the new people who read the New York Times and then the middle represents the people who read both. So if you're given a Venn diagram like this, with these expressed, to find the probability of A or B, you just add up all three. If you're given this probability, which would be 40%, plus this probability, which would be 25%, then if we wanted probability of A or B, we'd have to subtract the intersection, because we'd be counting the people who read both twice. Uh, so this is a good one to look over in your book, just to look over Venn diagrams and how they work. So we'd apply the conditional probability formula, the probability of B given A equals the, their intersection divided by the probability of A. Uh, their intersection is 0.05, and then the probability of A is 0 0.40, so the conditional probability is 0.125. That would be the probability that somebody reads the New York Times given that they read USA Today. So there's a 12.5 chance that a randomly selected student who reads USA Today also reads the New York Times. And there's an example of how we apply the conditional probability formula. Here's your multiple choice question. Um, this one's a little more challenging because it involves uh, drawing a tree diagram. Um, so I would, two things of help, I would draw a tree diagram to represent this. And then also I would um, go ahead and look at the note here. I gave you kind of steps in order to solve this. So please look at draw a tree diagram for the chance event of test A and test B, notice that they have different probabilities, and then use the complement rule because we want to find the, the probability of being negative even if steroids have been used. Uh, and then multiplication rule for independent events since these are independent. Also look over the summary in your book on page 328, and look over examples from the book. Examples are going to be extremely helpful for this lesson as they have Venn diagrams and those sort of things in them, as well as the vocab. But really look over those examples because those are the best way to visualize what these rules mean. Uh, then answer the free response question below and submit your work.